Today I want to talk to you about two things that you normally wouldn't put together, but Jesus does. I want to talk to you about the first and the worst. We often don't think about putting the first and the worst together, but Jesus does so in one verse, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I'll quote it to you here in a little bit, but go ahead and turn there if you have your devices or your Bibles. The first and the worst. If you'll learn from the first, you'll be able to deal with and live in the worst. Uh, when we think of first, let's start there since it's first. Uh, when we think of first, um, we often never forget a first. We can remember our first car. We remember our children's uh, first words, or we remember where we were when they took their first steps. We uh, can remember first dates. We can even remember first kisses. Ooh, some of you might want to not remember that one. Or how about this one? First impressions. History tends to remember the names of people who were first, the, the first on the moon, the first to break uh, the four minute mile, the first under 10 seconds, the first to score a certain amount, the first to a certain milestone. We uh, do not really ever forget our first. Here's the thing though, first are doorways and what we say continued promise. They're doorways of promise because uh, when we have a first step, we think there's gonna be continued more steps. When we have a first date, we're hopeful that there'll be more dates. They're doorways into a hopeful future. You know, the Bible is no different. We call this in a, a theological framework, we call this the law of first use. When a word or a concept or a person is first introduced in scripture, uh, it allows us and sets the parameters. It allows us to see how uh, that word may be interpreted throughout the rest of scripture. So that any time a word in the biblical text uh, appears for the first time, pay attention. Well, today we're gonna look at uh, the first time in the scripture that the word church appears. The first time that the word church appears and the person who introduces the word to the biblical text is a person, pretty important person, by the name of Jesus. Matthew 16, 18, in uh, the flow of conversation, he makes a very bold statement. He says this, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, some translations say, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now think about that. I will build my church and the gates of hell, Hades, will not prevail against it. We've been on a long journey uh, studying the, uh, the history of humanity and how God begins this salvific, this mission of redemption all the way back in the beginning of Genesis that doesn't even come to culmination until the book of Revelation. So it starts in this garden with Adam and Eve where we have the three calls of humanity. We've talked about how they bear the image of God and they are to rule all of God's creation. So there's this royal ruler aspect to the call of humanity. There's another one where he says uh, that God wants them to cultivate Adam and Eve his creation, to make sure it flourishes in a, in a priestly role to care for. And then the prophetic where he names entities of creation and they are to partner with him naming the animals to continue God's creative work. So they are in a prophet role. So you have Adam and Eve and they are put in charge of this paradise that the Bible calls Eden, the Garden of Eden. And then they are to make sure that it is fruitful and multiply and multiplies. In other words, it is to go beyond its boundaries. It is to be expansive if it is taken care of. Then you have uh, they sin, and, but the call of God is irrevocable and it moves throughout the Old Testament and ultimately resides on a nation, a group of people called the Israelites. But God in the call of humanity, he still has what we call prophets, priests, royal rulers, kings, who remind the nation of Israel of their God-given call and chosenness. He reminds them of their mission to declare his glory and character to the nations of the world, which would, we would put here. So you have prophets, priests, rulers, Israel, nations. But then Jesus, the anointed one, the only one who fulfills all three roles, prophet, priest, royal ruler, comes onto the scene. And he begins to say, you know what? I, have, I want you 
to, to be my disciples and I want you to make disciples of all nations. So you still have this Jesus, prophet, priest, royal ruler, trying to reach the nations of the world. But what is Jesus' chosen instrument? How will he fulfill this global transformation? And that's why Jesus begins to talk about this entity, if you will, called the church. Now, when Jesus introduces it, Jesus has options. He could have said, I will build my temple, but he didn't say that. He could have said, I will build my synagogue, but he didn't say that. He says, I will build my church. But church is the English translation of the Greek word ekklesia. And when Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia, if you were at the table eating with Jesus, you would have stopped eating, your mouth would have been agape, and you would have been like, Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? Because Jesus does not choose temple or synagogue. He chooses a concept that every single one of the people around Jesus would have known what he was talking about, but they would have been aghast that he was borrowing something from the Roman rulership to describe his church, his people. You see, ecclesia was this concept that Rome adopted from the Greeks that said this, that wherever two or three were gathered, the many or the few, could have been a small assembly or a large assembly, whenever they gathered together to do the business of Rome, that was an ecclesia. It could have been done domestic or abroad. It could have, uh, uh, you could have been on Roman city-state soil or you could have been in another nation far away geographically from the city-state of Rome. But if two or three people were gathered together there, Roman citizens, to do the business of Rome, in that place, wherever they were, guess what? The power of Rome's military was present and the authority of the emperor was present as they were assembling together. And Jesus chooses that concept and that word to describe this thing that we now call the church. So when I hear that, I gotta ask a question. Why did Jesus choose that word? What was it, uh, the, first, the law of first use? What are we supposed to understand about that? I think we can infer some, uh, some, some principles here that I think really speak to us today. The first is this, is that the ecclesia was building this. It was not limited by a location or a place, because if you tore the building down, then the ecclesia would cease to exist. So it was buildingless. I love also that the ecclesia was boundaryless. It could operate any place, anywhere, anytime. So it was anywhere and any place the ecclesia could operate. It was boundaryless, it was buildingless, and probably one of the most important things, it was empowering. It was a people movement. It wasn't just centered on a select few. Anybody could represent the entity of Rome any place, anywhere around the world. I think this is what Jesus is wanting us to learn here because if he chooses synagogue and if he chooses temple, that's too static. But he chooses ecclesia and it has movement. I look at it like this, the difference between a swamp and a river. Both contain life. But if you were to go to a swamp, it contains life, but you'd have to find it. You would be limited to its location and you would only receive its benefits if you could get to it. It is static. Nothing's really flowing in or out. But if there's a river, there's movement. And where the swamp contains life, the river can bring life. So Jesus very carefully selects this word as his chosen instrument to bring global transformation to the world. And he introduces the church, the ecclesia. It is buildingless, it is boundaryless, and it is an empowering work amongst the people. But this is what Jesus does. He takes the first and he connects it with the worst. I think probably, I'm reading this, the word that we just skip over that's probably the most important word is and. And is a conjunction. And means that in order for the, the, uh, the second to be true, the first is true. They're both true at the same time. And that one is dependent upon the other. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So Jesus, 
When he introduces this ecclesy of the church, he wants you and I to understand. He makes a very strong, bold statement. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, why did Jesus choose that phraseology and that place called the gates of Hades or the gates of hell? What am I supposed to see and to learn from that? And what does that have anything to say to us about this thing that we call the church, the ecclesia? Well, there was a city, uh, to give you a bit of context, called Caesarea Philippi. And it was famous for a few things. The first was that it was the place where you had the temple of Caesar, where you could literally worship the emperor, the Caesar of Rome. Uh, also, it housed the temple of a god named Pan, one of the most popular gods of all of Rome. So this was a, a very strategic city where people would come from all over the Roman Empire to worship the emperor Caesar and to worship this god called Pan. But also in this city, there was a cave, not a building, but a cave, where different cults would gather together. And what they would do is they would worship the devil through animal sacrifice and human sacrifice. It was known at that time as the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. And Jesus says, I will build my church, my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Now, Jesus is doing something here that all great communicators sometimes employ in their communication. And that's this, is he takes things to the extreme to prove that it will work in all circumstances. Because if it'll work there, it'll work anywhere. So he's saying, listen, if you end up in a place, the gates of Hades, where it is as the devil dwells there, and you're in a situation, the worst case scenario situation that you can think of, the very gates of hell. I want you to know, if you find yourself in that place, that my ecclesia, my power and my authority will be present in you and through you, even in that situation. I know that for uh, uh, many of us may remember this uh, worst case scenarios handbook where they would walk you through all kinds of scenarios that you may never find yourself in. But just in case you did, you're, 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 you're walking in a path and you're being attacked by a swarm of bees or you're being attacked by a bear or you're jumping out of an airplane and your parachute doesn't open. How do you survive these worst case scenarios? Well, Jesus is giving his hearers the worst case scenario. I want you to know that even if you find yourself here, in that place, in that situation, that my kingdom, my church, my power and authority will still operate. What tells us this is that there's no, there's no season in the world where Jesus does not have a church. That's important. No matter how bad things get in this world, Jesus will always have an ecclesia, a representation representing his kingdom, power, and authority on this earth. He will always have a people doing his work on this earth. Number two, you can learn this from that, is that it will always come under attack. It will always be under attack. And then lastly, here's what you can draw from conclusion from that, is that no attack from the devil himself will destroy God's church or God's people. Come on. That's encouraging. I will build my ecclesia and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. I remember a moment when uh, the reality of the scripture became true for me. I was in college. I was in Bible college studying to, to be a pastor in one of the things that I did to work my way through school is I would uh, wash windows. And I found myself in all kinds of different places. One of the places that I would often uh, have to wash windows in was a bar. But this wasn't just any bar. It was a Somalian bar located in downtown Minneapolis. It was uh, filled with Muslim men. And one day I'm in there and I'm washing the windows, and I have this gentle nudge from the Holy Spirit, very specific, 
that I feel a prompting to do something that I've never done before that and I've never done since. I felt as if the Holy Spirit was asking me to tap every single person sitting at the bar on the shoulder to introduce myself and to tell them that Jesus loved them and he changed my life and they'd like to hear more about that. I'd, be, I'd love to talk to them. Oh, I was scared out of my mind. I'm thinking this is the last place where I would think that the Holy Spirit would be asking me to do something like this. I mean, uh, this is the, probably the one place I would think that, yeah, this is not where I should be doing this kind of stuff. But I couldn't ignore it. I knew it was the voice of God. So I m took a moment to go to a corner and pray and I come back out and muster all the courage I could. And there's about 10 people, I know because I counted, sitting at the bar. And tap the first person on the shoulder, introduce myself. Hey, my name is Ricky Spindler. And hey, uh, I just want you to know that Jesus has changed my life. And I'd love to talk to you more about his love for you. And every single person, I went down the line, talk about rejection. Every single one, I was like, oh, for 10 rejected me. But I felt like, you know what? I could rejoice. At least I was obedient to what Jesus was telling me to do. So I leave the bar and I go about my way. And, and now I'm cleaning a video store just a few blocks down. There are windows out on the main street. When I see out of the corner of my eye, somebody run out of the bar and look both ways. And they see me and they turn and they start walking down the sidewalk to me. And I'm thinking, oh no, man, I'm in trouble now. So I pretend like I don't see them and I just start washing the window. And then all of a sudden they come and tap me on the shoulder and they ask me this question, why did you do that in there? And I just said, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bible college student. I'm a Christ follower. I love Jesus. I just felt like this is what God wanted me to do. He said, listen, I gave my life to Christ a while ago, but I've really struggled I've really struggled because of the pressure from family and friends, and I've really wanted to turn my back on that. But listen, I just want you to know that I will never be the same because of what you just did. And would you pray for me right now? And I prayed for that person, and, and they turned and left away. I have no idea what the rest of that story is, but I just thought about this. You know, listen, even in a Somalian Muslim bar, the power and the authority of Jesus Christ can be at work in a very significant way. I think this first and the worst, connecting these two things together, can be life-changing. And, and I'll bring it to a conclusion in this way. I'm under no illusions that every single week that people watch this, and you may feel like you're the worst sinner. I know one of the writers of the scripture by the name of the Apostle Paul did, he called himself the chief of sinners. You may feel like you are the worst sinner or because of your, sin, your sinful decisions, you feel like you're in the worst possible situation you could ever be in. Well, let me be the first person to tell you that there is no sinner beyond the reach of the love and the care and the concern of Jesus Christ. And the fact that you're watching this proves that. And there's no situation that you've made your, for yourself in or the consequences of your sin that is beyond the powers and the ability of Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, that when Jesus died, he spent three days in hell and he took from death and Hades its power and authority. He took the keys of hell. He stripped it of its power. So he alone has the power and authority to forgive and to set you free from your sins. But I'm also talking to a different group of people in here. I'm talking to a group of people who you, you love Jesus, you're part of the ecclesia, and you're wondering if this thing that you call Christianity will work in your worst case scenario situation. Some of you may be living in that moment. You may be a college student and you move from your home into a dorm, F-A-R, L-A-R, and now you're on this dorm and you're being introduced to all kinds of ideologies and concepts and all kinds of sensuality and all kinds of sinful behavior. You're being tempted you're, and you're wondering, what could Jesus possibly want to do in this place? Listen, I'm talking to you. Could it be that the whispers of God, the nudgings of the Holy Spirit could come to you and in this worst case possible scenario, God may want to be doing some kingdom work through you. 
Maybe you are uh, out on the job and you're thinking, man, there's no way that, that Jesus could do some work in here. And there's, uh, sometimes we're good at telling God what he can't do in specific situations. But maybe this is the Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning, this afternoon, this evening, challenging you. You really are hearing him and he wants to do a work in what you would call the worst possible situation. But I'm also speaking to a third group here. And that is this, as you look upon the landscape of your community across the street, uh, the place where you live and work, maybe you're seeing hell at work in somebody's life, in some community's life, in some situation's life. And rather than run away from it, rather than turn away from it, could it be that God is calling you towards that, to the gates of Hades, to represent the kingdom of God? The power and the authority of Jesus Christ is in you and wants to work through you rather than stepping away. Could this be a confirmation from the Lord that you need to step towards that instead of stepping away from it. I believe this message has spoken to all of us. I know it's spoken to me. And so what I'd like to do right now at this moment, I'd like to seal this time with prayer. So I'm gonna ask you as you watch to bow your heads, to close your eyes, and just to create a God-shaped moment. And if you're here and you need to receive the forgiveness of sin, you need the Lord to deliver you from sinful situations, circumstances. I want you to be praying, inviting Jesus, turning from your sin and towards him and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. There's no magic words. It's the faith in your heart expressed through your words for Jesus to forgive you and cleanse you of your sins that saves us. You begin to pray. And now I'm talking to those that maybe you feel like you're in the worst case place. You're in that place and you can see all kinds of things going on and you're like thinking, God has put me here. Would you just pray? Holy Spirit, help me. Would you begin to just pray uh, that, that you would walk in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ? Lord, help me know who I am. Lord, help me to be encouraged instead of discouraged this morning. God, help me to see that you want me to be here. You place me here because you want to do something here. Help me to see it and know it. And then for the third one, just pray for open eyes. Say, Wherever I see it, Lord, speak to me about it. God, I'm willing to step towards the gates of hell and your power and authority. Whatever you're telling me or asking me to do, I'll take a step in that direction. Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that you married the first and the worst together, that you will build you are building something. You're building people right now. You're building your work right now. You're building your ecclesia right now. You're, a pandemic doesn't scare you, doesn't stop you. You are at work. It doesn't matter who's president, who's not president. You are building your church. And we're grateful for that. I pray that you would have, give us open ears and open eyes to see and to hear what you're doing. And rather than step away, let us step towards. We thank you for these words. May they bear fruit in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, my name is Esther. And wow, what a great message we just heard. We hope this service was meaningful and life-changing. If you gave your life to Christ today, we just wanna celebrate with you. Let us know by clicking the link in the chat so we can help you move forward with your walk with Christ. We believe you've made the best decision for your life. You should know that you're a part of a praying church. Maybe you're watching this today and you need a prayer, whether that's for you or family member or a friend, we would be honored to partner with you in prayer. You can share your prayer request by clicking the link in the chat. Now, as we conclude our time together today, if you're a first time guest, would you do us a favor and fill out our connection card? This is just one way that we can get to know each other better. You can click the link in the chat or text the word connect to the number on the screen. Finally, we would love to share our story with you through what we call chapter one. Every story has a beginning and this is ours. It's the perfect opportunity to learn more about our history and values here at Stone Creek. It's been a privilege to see you today and we can't wait to see you next week. But until then, may God richly bless you. Have a great rest of your day.